Welcome back. We are going to talk about a problem called uh, R arborescences today. And uh, this problem, of course, by itself is interesting. It relates very much to the spanning tree problem. Um, it's, it's a version of that on directed graphs. But um, what it's really going to be for us is the first uh, problem that we've seen so far that has an exponential number of constraints. And uh, it's worth just describing it. And, and then we'll finish this lecture by asking what, what is to be done, if, if anything, about, about such, a, such a problem. Can any, can any approach of, uh, help, us, help us through in terms of solving it? OK, so let's just start by discussing what, what are the computational tools that we've seen um, so far. So, so basically, it's, it's not that much. We've really um, seen the, the simplex algorithm. And you know, the algorithmic implementation of a simplex al algorithm, which has been uh, the Tableau. <clears throat> and the Tableau method. And then we've seen some specialized algorithms. Um, like what we saw for uh, the reachability problem in Shortest Path or uh, Ford Fulkerson. And I should note that there, there are a number of details in, about Ford Fulkerson in particular that, that, uh, that have been omitted in the lectures. Um, there, there's also going to be a lecture that, that, discusses, that discusses those. Um, and what we're going to see in this, um, in this lecture is that uh, simplex in particular is not enough, um, and it's and it's not enough. Of course, it's not enough. So you can't solve every every problem. But but in particular, it's not enough in the sense that uh, you need to be in order to run simplex. It seems, at least initially, the, the way we've introduced it, uh, we need to. And in order to write the tableau, we need to basically be able to write down the matrix A, the constraint matrix. So the real question is what to do, if anything, if we have a huge number of inequalities, say facets. Um, and this is going to motivate the ellipsoid algorithm, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So this will motivate eventually the ellipsoid algorithm. Okay, but uh, for now we're going to we're going to go back and introduce a specific combinatorial problem called R arborescences, and it is a problem defined on a directed graph. So given a directed graph D, which has vertices and arcs that have a direction, and the little r in the, in the name, a root r. The definition of an arborescence, or and in particular the, an arborescence rooted at r, or for short an r arborescence, is uh, the following, um, a set of arcs, call it A dash, which is a subset of A, is called an R arborescence, or an arborescence rooted at R, that's the same thing, the jargon, um, if the arcs in A dash form a spanning tree of D. And in particular, what that means, every node that's not equal, that's different from R, different from the root, is the head of exactly one arc 
in a dash. And the head of a directed arc is exactly what it sounds like. So this is the this is the um, this is the head of an arc. Okay, so this is this is uh, what it means. I also want to define a very related uh, notion called a cut rooted at R. So we've already talked about uh, cuts when we were discussing um, max flow and min cut. But now cuts are going to be a subset of edges. A subset C for cut of the arcs A is called an R cut or a cut rooted at R if C is equal to, remember this notation from the previous lecture, delta minus of V dash for some subset V dash of V but uh, excluding R. And uh, remember that um, delta minus is the set of edges coming into a set of nodes. And similarly, delta plus would be the set of edges out of. So uh, delta minus of a particular node would just be all of the edges that are pointing to that node. Delta plus of a single node would be all of the edges leaving, uh, leaving, leaving that, that node. And uh, we can define a minimal cut. Again, the, the terminology is close to min cut, but we, we shouldn't necessarily conf confuse this. Uh, a minimal cut is uh, defined um, is defined uh, inclusion wise. Um, So as, uh, as, a, as an example, here's a simple line graph. And this last node is R. So this is, um, this is, my, this is my graph. And uh, a, an example of a non-minimal cut would be if I choose V dash to be both of those nodes, then uh, the non-minimal cut. Let's just let's just say, um, yeah. Let's just say all of these nodes are. Let's just pick a particular orientation. It, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, so what would uh, C be in this case? So if these if, if these two define V dash, then uh, C would be the set of nodes that are pointing into V dash. So that would be this edge and this edge. That would be C. But you can see that there is a subset of those arcs in C that forms another cut, namely, um, you know, just just uh, just this uh, just this one. So that let's call that C dash subset of C. That would be a minimal cut. So I've defined minimal here not in the context of um, not in the context of capacity or something like that. It's just inclusion wise. So. This is pretty common terminology. We'll talk about minimal versus uh, minimum. Um, so this is uh, the definition of an arborescence and also of a cut, both of them rooted at uh, R. And so if I now put uh, lengths on these edges, we can ask for the shortest R arborescence. So uh, if each edge or arc, I should say, has a length, let's say Cij. We're overloading C a little bit. Actually, we're overloading most letters, so, but hopefully it'll be clear from context. Um, then, uh, then for an arborescence, an R arborescence A dash, which again is a subset of the arcs, its length is, is what you expect. Um, it is just the sum over 
all edges in A of Cij, the usual, the usual definition. So now let's think about writing this in terms of linear programming. That is, that is our game uh, so far. So let's, um, so let's make an LP, uh, an LP out of this. And so I, I need to embed this into um, Rn for some, uh, for some n. Um, so how am I going to do this? This is going to be useful not only for this problem, but it's going to be a general technique that we use all the time for, for graph problems. And, and the idea is uh, simple. Um, for any subset of the arcs, I'm going to define the incidence vector to be uh, chi b. Actually, let me uh, use a superscript there. Chi superscript b is going to be an element of r to the uh, cardinality of the arcs. And actually, more precisely, it'll be an element of 0, 1 to the a. Uh, I didn't write, I didn't mean to say r is equal to that. Uh, let's say, you know what I mean, but let me move this here. Okay, so that, so this is, this is what xb is, and, 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 and it's defined by, um, given by chi b, it's going to have a, a coordinate for every arc, and that coordinate is either 0 if it's not in b, or if it's, it's 1 if it is in b. So this is equal to 1 if the arc little a belongs to b, and it's 0 if little arc is uh, not in b. Okay, so... So this, so that means that every single corner of uh, the zero one cube in cardinality of a uh, dimensions um, corresponds to some subset of the edges. So, so in other words, um, arborescences in particular, arborescences correspond to or let me let me just write more generally. Um, each corner of zero one to the a corresponds to some subset of a, and in particular, arborescences correspond to a subset of those corners. Correspond to a subset of the corners because not every corner which every corner corresponds to a set of edge of arcs, not every subset of arcs uh, corresponds to an arborescence. But arborescences correspond to a subset of the corners of uh, 0, 1 to the A. So I am going to let, I'm going to define a set uh, script X to be the convex hull, or just conv sometimes, I'll denote it like that, convex hull of all of these vectors where b is now restricted to be an r arborescence. Clearly this is a polytope. It's bounded. It is comp comprised of the convex hull of a finite number of corner points. That defines a polytope. And since it defines a polytope, we can simply note that now if I solve minimize c transpose x subject to x in script x, this is a linear program. Moreover, this is a, a linear program whose solution, if we use simplex method and therefore get a solution at a corner point, is guaranteed by definition to be an arborescence. So note that you know, there's nothing here requiring x to take a, an integer value, but just by virtue of linear programming, by the fact that linear programming takes uh, an optimal solution at a corner, we know that this is that that uh, we're, we're going to take a value at a corner. And because we constructed script X to be the convex hull of all possible R arborescences, this problem will find uh, the solution that we want. So this is an LP whose solution is the shortest R arborescence. Obviously the problem is how do we find this? 
So again, the, uh, how, do we, how do we run LP? We don't know how to run LP on a set X that's defined as the convex hull. Our only algorithm for running linear programming so far requires that uh, the, the feasible set be defined in the form AX less than B or one of the, uh, one of the equivalent forms. That, and, and that's clearly not how X is specified, even though it is a polytope. And in fact, we already saw examples uh, in previous lecture of, of a set that could have a small number of extreme points, but has exponentially number, exponential number of facets. A, a simple example is the L1 ball. It has two N, in N dimensions, it has two N extreme points, but you need two to the N uh, inequalities to define it, and that way it's the dual of the cube. Okay, so this is our uh, our question. How are we going to uh, how are we going to solve it? Okay, now let's 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 pause for a second uh, on our discussion of LP and go back to a key combinatorial insight. And most often, the solution to these types of problems is going to be a combination of tools uh, that are come from linear programming like duality with some key insight that comes from combinatorial optimization. And and, and that is exactly the case here. So there is this relationship between R cuts and R arborescences called the blocking relationship. So there's blocking relationship is a blanket name and there are many other situations where two objects like this have a blocking relationship. We're not gonna define it in general, but, but uh, that, that's why it's, it's given this more general name. Okay, so um, the, 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 the key is, um, a key is, is, is the follows, is, is the following. Um, now we know that, uh, let me just write the definition again, that C, a subset of A, is called an R cut if C equals all the edges into some set, sorry, V dash, where V dash is a subset of V excluding uh, excluding the root. And again, C is called minimal if it is inclusion-wise minimal, meaning it does not contain any proper subset that is also a cut. Note, again, let's not get conf confused between, uh, between that and um, uh, between that and uh, a minimum, a min cut. Okay, so uh, these are these are our cuts, and recall that uh, an R arborescence is a subset, another a different subset of the edges, such that every uh, node in V, except for R is the head of exactly one edge and not more than that. So these two objects, which we've, which we've defined before, have a blocking relationship in the following sense. And I'll write it as a theorem, uh, even though it doesn't take uh, any special machinery to prove. But it is a key, it is a key idea here. R arborescences are exactly the inclusion-wise minimal sets intersecting all R cuts and also minimal R cuts are exactly the minimal sets intersecting all R arborescences. So what does this mean? What this is saying, so the first statement is saying that if you have, if you have a graph with certain, with some uh, directed edges, etc. I'm not going to um, draw the whole thing. Um, then 
is there what set what subset of the edges intersects every single possible R cut and so clearly um, all of the uh, uh, clearly all of uh, if I take the all edges then these obviously will intersect any R cut of course but it is not minimal so uh, as I start throwing away edges what this result says is that uh, the inclusion wise minimal set that intersects every single R cut is going to be an arborescence which means that something that is not an arborescence does not intersect every single uh, every single R cut and you can so, so you should try to show that so uh, show that if you have a subset of the edge of edges that is not form an R arborescence um, I guess we need to be more precise if I show that if you have an R arborescence and you throw away an edge then uh, then you can find an R cut that doesn't that doesn't include it I'm sorry that doesn't intersect it and and, and also vice versa so I think that you, know, we, you can either try to prove it formally uh, which I encourage you to do or just convince yourself that indeed this um, that this uh, this makes sense so we're gonna use this key intuition in order to uh, write down what this set X is what is this convex hull so this is our next uh, this is the next thing that we're um, that we're going to do okay um, so the, the the claim is the following consider this this linear program minimize C transpose X subject to X in X where X is the convex hull of chi to the B this the indicator or incidence vector of all uh, R arborescences this is what we had before this is we know that this is correct but it's it's abstract we can't we can't use it we want something in terms of inequalities and the claim is that this is the same I guess I don't really need the objective but I'm just writing it anyway it's, it's, the, it's the set that I need okay so now let's see what I'm gonna write X of, I'm gonna write it in a bit compact notation and then we'll, we'll unwrap it Delta minus of W greater than or equal to 1 for every W that's not equal to the empty set and is a subset of V excluding the root and every X uh, has to be an element of 0 1 for every a in a so in other words X in both of these minimization problems is uh, a vector that has an uh, coordinate for every arc in a and what this is saying if you look at this is since X can only take values in 0 or 1 what X is doing is providing a subset of the edges and what is this what, what is this therefore saying uh, Delta minus of W is all of the edges pointing into W and X of Delta minus of W is basically just counting since X is a zero one vector it is just counting the number of edges that point into W and this is saying that for oh and by, and what is Delta minus of W this is a cut right so this Delta minus of W for every W this this just is a an R cut not necessarily a minimal R cut so really what this is saying is that X encodes a subset of edges which intersects at at least one arc every possible cut because all possible cuts are given by Delta minus of W when W is allowed to range over all subsets of V excluding the root node R so uh, this is leveraging the previous uh, theorem which says that R arborescences are uh, are, are defined as those minimal inclusion wise minimal sets subsets of arcs which which intersect every single um, every single arc I'm sorry every single R cut okay so this is a uh, so this is what it says so certainly um, it's well uh, I don't want to bully you into believing it but convince yourselves that uh, that these two have equal value 
um, in terms of optimal solution and optimal value. Okay, so uh, the claim here is that is that uh, this integer program is the shortest, I'll just write min r, or is, I should say, solves the min r arborescence problem. So this has gotten us a step closer. It's not gotten us exactly where we want because we have, this is not a linear program. I have these integer constraints. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm a little bit closer because at least now I have something explicitly defined in terms of inequalities. So a main result, which we're not going to cover right now, um, is a theorem due to Edmonds from 1967. Edmonds has uh, his name attached to many, many fundamental results which says that the LP relaxation of the above integer program is exact. So what does that mean? Let's write down the feasible set that we had for the, uh, for the IP. Um, it is all X such that x of delta minus of w is greater than or equal to 1 when I have these constraints for every uh, non-empty w subset of v minus uh, the root node. And also, x a belongs to either 0 or 1. And the LP feasible set is all x, again, that we, ha we have the same constraint, such that xa is now in the interval 0, 1. In other words, xa is greater than 0 and less than 1. Now this is an LP. So uh, what, theorem, what, what uh, Edmonds' theorem says is that the convex hull of these points is equal to this set. Again, the magic of LP here such a simple property, but so powerful. We know that an LP take has, a, has an optimal value at an extreme point. Therefore, if the extreme points of the LP are exactly what we want and nothing else, then if we solve this LP, uh, we have solved the IP. If we've solved the IP, the integer program, we know, or at least we claimed in the previous slide, that this solves the minimum R arborescence problem. Very good. So where where are we uh, so far? Have we uh, arrived? So are we there? And and, and you can see that we're not. Um, so now we have formulated the R arborescence problem, the shortest R arborescence problem, as an LP. No integer constraints, no other abstract constraints of convex hull of whatever. We just have it as, you know, what, what I mean is it looks like minimize C transpose X subject to AX less than B. Let me put this in quotes. This is basically what we, what we have if we, if we take, if we use Edmund's theorem. But the problem is that we have the number of uh, rows of A, which is typically denoted by M, is equal to the number of subsets, of non-empty subsets of uh, V excluding the root node, which of course is exponential. So we have an exponential number of facets, and so um, we don't know how to proceed <coughs> using, using what we've de developed so far. In general, if you want to solve a linear program with an exponential number of facets, with any number of facets, you have no choice but to look through every single one, if it's completely general with no additional special structure. Because note that for a general A and B, if I give you uh, an X, just checking whether uh, it's feasible requires exponential time. But 
this is not an issue for us because we need to take we need to be a little bit careful to to remember what does exponential time mean. Um, what I mentioned, what I said, kind of lured you into the into that trap by saying it's exponential time. Uh, it's exponential in the dimension, but if you if if uh, but but for polynomial time optimization problems, we want to be polynomial in the description length, which means that the effort to specify uh, a and b, I need to be polynomial in that, in the number of bits required to encode a and b. So for a completely general LP, if you need to specify an exponential number of constraints, typically this won't be a problem for me, and an LP is, is, is happy. That's why we're generally satisfied to have an algorithm that is polynomial in the dimension n and the number of constraints, m. But in this case, you see that our graph, which can be very compactly specified, so it can be specified in, with polynomial effort in the size of, uh, in, in the number of nodes and edges, um, actually is able to encode an exponential number of inequalities. And this is where the whole problem is. This is why I can't just blindly write down A and try to run the simplex method on, uh, on, on A. So it's exponential in the description length of the problem. Okay, but it turns out that there is hope for us uh, in, this, in this particular case. And that is, again, going to come from a particular combinatorial uh, insight. And, and, this is, and, and this is what's going to give us hope. It's not going to tell us how to run simplex method, but it's, it's, it's still going to give us hope. So what is a fundamental thing that we need to, we need to do? You know, we have, these, uh, we have this set of constraints, x of delta minus of w greater than or equal to 1 for any non-empty w subset of v excluding the root. So at the very least, what I should be able to do, what I should ask is, uh, if I'm given some x, again, x does not take exponential time to specify. I just have x has one entry for every, for every arc. So given, and I'll write it as, uh, as y here. So given some value y, let's say with rational entries, I need to decide, um, is y feasible. Certainly this is an easier problem than optimization. If I can't solve this, if I can't decide if something is feasible in, uh, efficiently, then I shouldn't hope that I should be able to solve an optimization problem. We're going to put this in more rigorous footing in future lectures, but at this point I think that should be intuitive. So let's, uh, let's review. I, actually, we have some additional constraints. We have that in the relaxation. We have we have these constraints. So let's see w which of these constraints pose a problem. Clearly, it is not the constraints that y lies in the box. So in other words, checking whether 0 is less than y a is less than 1 for every a, this is easy. And it takes order a time. So that's not, a, that's not a big deal. So now I need to concern myself with this because this is I can't explicitly enumerate all subsets. And and uh, in, in, in polynomial time, and so this is the idea, and this is also part of our motivation for introducing the Ford-Fulkerson algorithm, because it turns out that uh, we can check whether a, whether y is feasible, whether it violates any of those exponentially many constraints, uh, by solving a small number of maximum flow problems. So here's, uh, here, is, here is the idea. Uh, for any S, any node S that is not equal to the root node, I'm going to treat, I'm going to make up a max flow problem with source S and uh, in sync T. So uh, in sync R. Okay, so S and R are going to define a maximum flow problem. Remember that maximum flow is defined by a graph, by a directed graph, by a, a, a special, two special nodes, S and T. For us, they'll be S and R, and also capacities. We don't have capacities here, but this is what we're going to use Y for. We know Y is non-negative, 
and it has to it has to be non-negative so i'm going to just imagine i'm going to make up a max flow problem where y are the capacities so uh for every s in this graph and there are not many of them and there's order v order v of them find a minimum capacity r s cut which i'll denote by so i'm going to use the terminology of cut from max flow that was a subset of nodes but i'm also now going to i'm going to denote it in terms of its edges so these things are equivalent whether i tell you the cut by telling you what edges are uh, make up that cut or if i tell you the cut by telling you what are the two parts of it these these two are equivalent and since here we're talking about edges i'm going to denote this by cs so this is a subset of the, of the arcs so i'm going to find a minimum capacity rs cut cs where i treat the elements of y as the capacities in other words the vector b that i need to define a max flow problem i'm going to use y for that again y is non-negative um, so i can define a max flow problem and we know that we can solve it for example by a primal dual method um, or it, it, more efficiently by by ford fulkerson but even in the worst case if if you say, you know, I, I'm not quite sure on all the details of Ford Fulkerson, uh, you, we know that we can just solve it using simplex, the simplex method uh, in primal dual. Um, so I'll just write by e.g. Ford Fulkerson or, or any, any way that you like. We know that it's certainly polynomial time. So the claim, the key claim, is that if I look at the capacity of cs that would be y cs this is our notation uh, if i have a vector of numbers y y of a set is just the sum over all of those so y of cs is just the sum of all the coefficients of y that correspond to edges in uh in cs so uh the claim here is that if i look at the capacity of that minimum cut and now I look at the smallest of all of those over all possible choices of S. Then this actually equals the minimum of Y of delta minus of W where W is some subset of V that doesn't include R. So this is the key point here. So on the left, I have something that has just order V, V minus one. So there's V minus one things over here. Each one of those I can compute using Ford Fulkerson. So I can compare, I can compare those and find the smallest. But this is the min that I actually care about and it's a, it's a minimum over an exponential number of, um, uh, it's an e exponential number of uh, potential, oops, potential things. And so this claim is saying that by using Ford Fulkerson V minus one times, I can compute uh, this, this value. So where do we go, where do we go from here? What, what this basically tells us is, this is the kind of the punchline that I, that I just mentioned, by computing V minus one min cuts, for example, by Ford Fulkerson, we find a minimal, a minimum capacity R cut let's call that delta minus of some w star if y of delta minus of w star is greater than or equal to one 
And of course, every y is between zero and one. We said that those are easy to check, so we've, we've done that already. Then y is feasible. And so you should convince yourself of this. It's basically saying that this is a way to search over those exponentially many constraints and efficiently. So if, if uh, this is greater than one, then of course, by definition, y is, is, is feasible. And if it's not, then this is also good for us because we have found a violated inequality. So otherwise, not only can we certify, not only do we report that it's infeasible, but we actually point to the reason. Otherwise, I'm sorry to squeeze it in on the bottom because this is kind of the key point. We have found a violated inequality. This doesn't help us yet. We, we can't just run simplex, but at least it tells us that we have some special structure. We have an LP with an exponential number of constraints, and we have a polynomial time algorithm which can determine feasibility, and if it's not feasible, it tells us, it, it hands us a constraint which is violated. And this is exactly what's gonna motivate uh, the ellipsoid algorithm, which is going to be the topic of the next lecture. So what the ellipsoid algorithm does is uh, just say we will see that the ellipsoid algorithm can solve this kind of problem. There's a few more details, but roughly speaking, um, the, what this kind of problem means is if we're given a convex set K, let's, for, for, actually we're going to specify, it, it, it's true for a general convex set, but let's just write, let's just write this uh, given a polytope P where that polytope P is only specified by an oracle. Specified by an oracle that either certifies that a point X is in P or provides a, an inequality that's feasible for P but violated by X. That's essentially what we, what we just saw. Right? That's what Ford Fulkerson does for us. We have a polytope that we don't need to write down explicitly. Given any point, run Ford Fulkerson a few times and it either certifies that y is in, in the polytope, or it says y is not in the polytope and here is an inequality that violates it. So what, what ellipsoid method is gonna do is, if this is what we're given, uh, and then we need some additional details, which we're gonna talk about, and uh, given um, a ball that contains P and a guarantee on the minimum volume of P. We'll talk about those details, so I'm writing them in parentheses. But the, the main spirit is, if we're given a polytope P by this, by this oracle, then ellipsoid algorithm finds a feasible point of Okay, so recapping again, what the slide says is, what is the ellipsoid algorithm going to do? If you give me a polytope and you specify it only by this, uh, by this oracle, ellipsoid algorithm either asserts that your polytope is empty, so it has no feasible set points, or it finds a feasible point. And what we showed on the previous slide is that we have exactly such an oracle for uh, this problem of our arborescences with exponentially many facets. 
So we will pick this up in uh, the next lecture.